So we're, we're standing there at the corner of Castro and Market Street, Marcello's Pizza Parlor. Some of you have probably been there. We got a Coke and a slice of pizza. We're standing on the corner. We, re, we pick up the San Francisco Chronicle and the, the, the headline, a thousand San Franciscans already dead. And I remember looking around that intersection and realizing that of those thousand, who, almost every one of them had lived and died within six blocks of where I was standing. And there was no evidence. Pretty Victorian buildings, cafes, restaurants, clubs, the sound of music, the smell of coffee and food. No indication that you were standing at the epicenter of this appalling disaster that was soon going to rage across the planet. And I remember getting so angry and saying to my friend Joseph, you know, I wish, I wish with, we could knock these buildings down. Maybe if this was a meadow with a thousand corpses rotting in the sun, people would get it. They'd look at it, they'd see it, they'd understand it, and if they were human beings, they would be compelled to respond. But of course, there was no such evidence, and as you know full well, there was no response at all. And out of that anger and out of that hate came the idea, you know, let's all carry signs with the names of our friends who've died. These aren't just statistics. It's not percentages of Haitian immigrants and percentages of IV drug users and homosexuals and percentages of, of prostitutes. You know, this is how they talked about it then. Oh, it was so dehumanizing. There was nothing about the reality of the people behind those numbers. So I asked people, you know, I had Harvey's old bullhorn and I had stacks of cardboard and magic markers. I said, write down the names of your friends who've died. And they were ashamed to do it. That's how profound the stigma was at that time. They wrote Bob, or right, they wrote JR, or something like this. And then one kid took two pieces of cardboard and taped them together and printed in big block letters, Thomas J. Farnsworth, my brother, he's dead. And other people looked at that and became ashamed of their shame and began to write the first and last names of their friends and lovers and neighbors who had died. We carried those signs down Market Street, as we always do with our candles to City Hall for Harvey Milk and George Moscone. And then I had everybody go another two blocks to the old federal building in UN Plaza, which at that time housed Reagan's Health and Human Services West Coast Division offices. And we'd hidden extension ladders in the shrubbery. And we got a nun on a bike with a beard to distract the police over here. <laughs> And then we pushed through the police lines and we took our ladders and we placed them up against the wall and we climbed three stories up with big rolls of tape on our arms and we covered the gray front stone facade of the federal building with these names of our dead. It was a cold, drizzly night, no songs, no chants, no speeches, just thousands and thousands of San Franciscans, gay and straight alike, looking at these names on the wall and as I walked through the crowd I was listening to what they were whispering to each other and they said I didn't know he died when did she get sick I went to school with him we're from the same hometown when did he die nobody told me I didn't know and you know you could just feel the the desperate yearning need to find a way to break through the stupidity and the silence and the bigotry and all of the just human foolishness that still hampers our ability to respond to what has become the worst pandemic in the history of our species. And it, I got to the edge of the crowd and I looked back over that crowd at that patchwork of names on the wall and I thought to myself, it looks like a quilt. And I thought of my grandma, my great grandma back in Bee Ridge, Indiana and the quilts that she'd made from scraps because they were too poor to go out and buy blankets. I'm sure many of you have quilts like this that have been passed down through the generations in your family and I thought what a perfect symbol, what a symbol of middle class, middle American, traditional family values. I believe in traditional family values. I want them to apply to me and my family. And that was when I looked back at the wall and I saw this quilt stretching across the mall in Washington, D.C. And everybody said it was stupid and everybody said it would cost too much and everybody said no one's going to show up. And of course they were wrong. And the quilt became the largest community arts project in the world. And it joined together all the different kinds of people whose lives were being affected by this disease. It took off pretty quickly. I spent about nine months traveling around on Greyhound buses, you know, passing out flyers at clubs and things. And then the people finally saw it and they got it and they understood and they responded. And I found that the, the hatred 
and the fear and despair that had taken over my heart was now replaced with love and with courage and with hope for our future. I want to share one more quick little story, and then I know many of you have got to get home. But after we, we got back from the first display in Washington, D.C. on October 11, 1987, we got letters from all over the country, from every city and town in the United States, and every letter was different, but they all ended with the same plea. They said, you have no idea how bad it is where we live. Would you please bring the quilt to our community? So I bought a truck named Stella, and I hired the biggest, meanest truck driver I could. Her name was Deborah Resnick. <laughs> and, uh, we loaded up the quilt and traveled all across the United States and Canada for years. And in every town we visited, the quilt was unfolded as the centerpiece for locally coordinated fundraising and educational campaigns. After the first year, we got back to San Francisco and we hadn't shown the quilt to San Francisco yet. The city that gave birth to it, that gave us the first checks and the, the volunteers and the, the quilt panels. And, so we got the city to donate the Moscone Civic Auditorium, named after George Moscone, murdered all those years before with Harvey Milk. And all the school districts in the Bay Area sent their kids to uh, be part of the unfolding ceremony and reading the names of the dead as the quilts were unfolded. It was a beautiful day, and at the end of the, the opening ceremony, I went back to our little workshop on Market Street because I just wanted to be alone for a little while and I had bills to pay and letters to sort through and the, the workshop was quiet, the radios were off, it was empty, all of the quilt panels and volunteers were down at the center for the big display and I sat down in the back at a little table and began to sort through the bills to see which ones I could stall for another month and which ones really had to pay and I'm sitting there and I got that weird back of the neck sensation that I was being watched. I looked up and I saw an old woman standing on the sidewalk. She was peering through the plate glass windows. She had very, very dark brown skin, deeply lined. She was wearing a blue dress. I went, I opened the door, I said, we're open, you can come in, but the, the quilt's down at Moscone Center. I can give you directions how to get there. She crossed her arms. She looked at the ground. She wouldn't make eye contact. And I just left her alone. I went back to my desk, she walked around, I saw her touch some of the panels that had come in too, too late to be sewn in, in time for the display. She looked at some of the brochures, she sat for a moment by one of the sewing machines, and then without saying a word, she left. A few days passed, the workshop again was filled with people, you know, a group over here laughing as they remembered their uncle as they made his panel, another group crying over here as they shared stories of their mother who had just passed away, the radio was on, the sewing machines going, in the middle of all of that noise and chaos, this old woman appeared at the door again. She was wearing the same blue dress, she had the same scowl on her face, and her arms were crossed across her chest, but we saw as she came in that there was a piece of fabric in her arms. She told us she'd come on a Greyhound bus by herself from Kentucky and that earlier in the year her firstborn, her son, had come home from LA where he settled after serving in Vietnam and he was sick and she cared for him. And she never revealed to another human being the nature of her son's disease. I know many of you here have cared for your loved ones as they passed away. It's hard. It's really hard. It's hard physically, it's hard emotionally, it's hard spiritually. And without any help from anyone, this old woman cared for her son. She had been the choir director at her church. She didn't tell the pastor or anyone in the congregation. She was the matriarch of a large extended family. She told no one else in the family. And by herself, she cared for her son until his time was up. They lived a short distance from the county hospital. The ambulance came, took him to the hospital. It wasn't long. He was gone. She told us that she'd walked back to her home and that when she got to their house, she opened the front door and looked across the living room and saw her son's bedroom door standing open. And through that, she saw the hospital bed and the bedpan and the pills and the towels and the IV rack. And she closed the door and locked it and never opened it again. Months passed. She was waiting for a dentist appointment in the waiting room and happened to pick up a back issue of People magazine that had a little story in it about the quilt. And she read that 
And she went home and she packed her bags and got on a Greyhound bus and traveled by herself across the United States of America to the corner of Castro and Market Street and found us and came into our lives and into our workshop and told us this story and unfolded the fabric that was in her arms and said, this is my son. I have to go home now and clean out his room. I have no idea what happened to that woman. We never heard from her again, but I think of her constantly and how we felt in that room when she told us that story and how grateful we felt that we in San Francisco, who were mostly young and mostly white and mostly gay, had succeeded. We had created this symbol that found this old black woman alone with her grief in the hills of Appalachia and connected her and her son and their love and their struggle with all of us all the many different kinds of people across this planet who in the course of fighting back against HIV have come to finally understand what a tiny planet it is that we inhabit and how irrevocably all of our lives are linked. That's the lesson we must learn from AIDS. That's the message of the quilt. It is the message of every great revolutionary and spiritual teacher throughout history who have tried to teach us that our lives are linked, that all of our lives have value, all of our lives are worth fighting for. That's what the Courage Campaign is about, a movement that fights only for the narrow interests of its own members is a shallow movement doomed to failure but a movement that crosses borders, crosses boundaries, crosses barriers, is as fearless as Harvey Milk was when he began campaigning. Those are the movements that grow. Those are the movements that build. Those are the movements that win, and those are the movements that in fact can change the world. That's the movement we're building here. We need every one of you. We need to stick with it. Never give up. We are going to win. Thank you very much, Courage Campaign. Thank you all. I love you very much.